It's like every page should be able to stand on its own and pull you into the next page. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Patty Hirsch. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Patty Hirsch on the show with me today. Patty has a brand new uh, book called The Devil's Half Mile, and this book looks phenomenal. Uh, everything I've seen and read about it so far uh, is intriguing me on all of my, my fanboy levels. Uh, so I'm really excited to have you today, Patty. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks very much, Hank. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Patty, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, I think uh, my first memory of being of wanting to be a writer was I was at school, and uh, we had, we, we'd been given a writing project, and I, I decided to kind of write outside the lines of the project. I can't really exactly remember what it was, but I remember saying, whatever this project is, it's going to be much more fun if there's going to be a crime involved and, and, and I can, I'm going to, I'm going to write this story because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kid who's up to no good. I remember writing this thing. I thought this is so much fun. I guess I must've been maybe nine or 10 years old at the time. And it was so much fun. I thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to actually be able to do this for a living? And, you know, I was, I was, uh, I, I, I've been reading, um, you know, all sorts of sort of fiction at that time, of course, you know, obviously not the kind of adult fiction I, I read now and crime fiction that I read now. But, you know, I've been reading books and thinking, isn't it, wouldn't it be cool to be able to just want to, to be able to just tell stories for a living all, all, all your life? So I, get, I guess that was really the first taste of it. It took me sort of took me more than 30 years to get to that place. <laughs> but I guess I'm here now. <laughs> so even at a young age, you understood the concept of putting a protagonist in trouble uh, and, and having a mystery to solve. Yeah, I did. And you know what? Interestingly enough, that's, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist by trade. Sure. And, and that is kind of, I, I've, I've learned that that is central to, to journalism as well. I actually learned that pretty early on. It was like, you know, what, what really interests me in a, in a news story, it's not necessarily the the facts of the thing, the things that act that that happened. It's the it's the people that those things happen to. It's like it's the it's the person that you can connect with in a story. So you know, if there has been a robbery, it's the person who's been robbed. You know, how does that person feel? You know, it's a very touchy feely thing. But I think the answer to that question: you know, How do you feel, the person who's the victim in that situation? That's really the most compelling part of the story for me. So yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's in fiction and it's in nonfiction. It's part of storytelling. It's the character. What happens to the person? within that story and what the arc of that story is. It's really important to me. Uh, I I completely agree with you. And uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing a a great number of uh, journalists turned novelists. And uh, they have a really unique uh, view on storytelling. And and I definitely want to dig deep into that in just a few minutes. Um, You kind of beat me to the punch there. Uh, Oh, sorry, (laughs) man. No, that's that's quite all right. It's quite all right. Um, But you have a really uh, unique accent. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up, well, I'm I'm an army brat, right? My dad was in the British army. So I was educated in, but I'm very, I'm very connected to Ireland also. So my dad's in the British army. I don't know if you know this about the British army, but a lot of Irish people serve in the British army. And this has been the case, you know, the whole way through kind of the history of of Britain, of, of Britain, because of course, Ireland was a colony of Britain, of Britain. And, you know, jobs were scarce in Ireland. So the Irish used to serve in the British military, a great deal, you know, through the Napoleonic Wars, through the Victoria, the campaign during Queen Victoria's times. And, you know, the, the First World War is very famous because at the Battle of the Somme, you know, you had hundreds of thousands of Irish people died, you know, you know, serving for the British. So it's, it's this big tradition that we have as Irish of, of serving in the British military, if only because you can't get another job in Ireland, although it's changing a little bit now, of course. But so my dad was in the British military. We had these strong connections to Ireland. So I was educated in Dublin and in Belfast as well. And, uh, and then I went on to actually serve in the British military myself. Right. 
and uh, you were uh, you were a Marine, weren't you? That's right. I was a, a Royal Marines officer for about ten years, and you know I left school and um, I was fortunate enough to get a kind of a a cadetship where the the Marines sent me to university, which was great. So they gave me my university education, and then I paid them back with a few years service. And um, before they started drawing down all of the military and cutting spending and, you know, all of those usual tales that we hear about. What was uh, what was your assignment uh, in the Marines? What what uh, sort of job did you do? Well, I was an intelligence officer. So um, I was uh, I spent time in the Gulf as an infantry officer um, you know, commanding men uh, in, in, a, in an infantry unit. And then I went into intelligence and I served in Northern Ireland and I certainly we went back, we went back to the Gulf a second time for a second bite because we thought the Iraqis were come, going to come running through. So I guess uh, intelligence was my main specialty. Uh, were you interested in uh, journalism before this, or did this kind of trigger uh, your interest in journalism being on the ground and then wanting to convey those stories uh, after you got out of the military? That's a great question. Actually, it's kind of a little weird because I'd never, I was never really that interested in journalism. I was always very interested in news. I mean, one of the things that you do when you're an intelligence officer, in fact, generally – uh, as as a, a person who's in the military, we're very interested in what's going on in the news. So I was a big consumer of news. But um, when I was at this point in my career, I was like, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do next. I didn't really feel that I, I wanted to stay in the core because I'd been the aide to a general and I was able to kind of look around and see all the, tri- the career prospects. And none of them really looked that appetizing. And then when I was sent to the Gulf uh, the second time, um, I was actually in charge of looking after the press because as the intelligence officer, you know, it's all information control. So I was looking after the press, and these guys were having such a great time, these men and women. It was such wonderful company. I thought, wow, maybe maybe this is what I'd like to do. They, they get to travel the world, see interesting things, tell great stories, have a great time. It really rang a lot of bells for me. So that's when I made the decision actually to get into journalism. I can uh, – in all of your experiences that you're describing here, I can see that thread of storytelling that has followed you. Uh, through their uh, intelligence is, is uh, probably has uh, some storytelling uh, skills uh, that are needed in that and and uh, and obviously journalism uh, do you do you feel that thread uh, running through your your past lives as it were you know that's really I'd never even thought of that before but I think that's a really that's a really interesting thought yes I think you're absolutely right you know so they, they have this thing called the, the cycle of intelligence, which is where you have to uh, you have to um, acquire information, you then collate it, and then you uh, disseminate it, right? So, and dissemination is one of the most important parts of the of the intelligence cycle. You know, telling that story. If you don't tell it in an interesting and compelling way, your Marines are going to fall asleep, right? So it's really really important to tell the story well. I'd never even thought of that, but that's absolutely right. It was like one of the key things that you had to do was to have a really, really compelling narrative and a really interesting way of delivering um, and, you know, a compelling way of delivering that material so that it would actually stick in the minds of the people who were getting it. Wow. That's such a great insight. Thanks, Hank. <laughs> well, you're welcome. That That's free. You can have that. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how did you get your feet wet in journalism when, when you got out of the military? This had, uh, this had obviously interested you. How did you uh, start to pursue that career and, uh, and get your feet on the ground with it? Well, you know, I, I, I walked around um, a lot of newspapers and media companies in the U.K., because uh, I went back to the UK um, after the Gulf, and I was like, I was in Scotland. I was looking around. I did, I did a bunch of internships, and but it was, it became very clear very, very quickly that it was, it was going to be very hard for me to get a job in Britain uh, and in London in particular. And now there's this old expression in the UK that um, if you, uh, if you're having difficulty uh, getting a job in the UK, you could always become one of the filth, F I L T H, failed in London, try Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> so I. So I jumped on board, a, on board a plane, and I happened to have a friend who was living in Hong Kong, who's working as a lawyer, and he said, oh, they put me up in this enormous apartment. I've got loads of room. Come and stay. So I flew out, and I started to uh, take get these internships at various newspapers, and I got a job at the South China Morning Post, and I also got a job at the Hong Kong Standard. I was working, like a, I was working in double shifts in newspapers, and then I eventually got a job at CNBC, uh, the business TV program in Hong Kong, and that really kind of just that launched my career in journalism, really. That's really interesting that you land at CNBC because, uh, you know, from, from my vantage point and, and looking back over, 
uh, you know, things listed in your bio and, and different things that I've, I've, you know, found about you and kind of traced your career backwards. Um, it, there's a natural progression if you look backwards. Uh, but from your point then, uh, this probably had to seem like such a random, uh, group, uh, or, or, a random path to take to get to where you are. And and that's one of the things I love about doing the show is to see the circuitous route that we take to get where we are. Uh, and it, if you would have uh, planned when you were a kid and you, and you realized that, that storytelling gene that you had, you probably never would have picked these things in the middle that got you to where you are. Uh, but it's such an amazing thing to, to trace that back and to see those. Uh, you have some of the things in your, in your career, uh, have, have been that you have this gift for explaining the, the things that seem, uh, just too difficult to, for the layman to comprehend. Uh, are, are these some of the skills that you picked up when you first went to CNBC or, uh, did you realize that you had a knack for breaking things down? Um, how did that gift begin to, uh, express itself? Well, I guess I kind of sort of developed that knack of explaining stuff when I was an intelligence officer, because a lot of the time you've got to find, you know, you've got a, you've got a room th- uh, full of, you know, 30 Marines who are around 19, 20 years old. Right. You know, they're bored to death. You've got, to, you've got to get information across to them in a really simple way. I mean, it's just, basically it's just like being a teacher. You know, you've got a classroom. You want to be as compelling and as interesting as possible. So being able to, to kind of synthesize uh, information and, and, and you package it and get it across in, a, in, a, in, a, in an easily consumable way. It's like a real, it's a very useful skill. So I guess I kind of developed it there, but I really honed it in at CNBC because a lot of the time, you know, when you're working in television and in radio, in fact, in broadcast generally, you've got to get across that thought really super fast. You don't have many tools to do it in, so you've got to be able to kind of really encapsulate that stuff in, sort of in, in like a 30-second burst. Oh, the bonds are doing this for this reason. And, you know, it's even worse when you're talking about business where stuff like, you know, drives people crazy and sends them to sleep. So you've got to really, really encapsulate that stuff. So it was very, I guess that's really where that skill got absolutely honed, I think, in that, in that place. Uh, were market economics and, uh, and business, were those things that came naturally to you? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I was just, I guess things come naturally too if you're interested in them, right? And I was sure. interested in business. I was interested in the way markets work. And I was interested, I was interested in, you know, right, right, let's be honest, Frank, I was interested in money, you know? Right. <laughs> so, you know, the way that money works really interested me. And, you know, I would find that stuff out myself. And, you know, the, the thing is, you know, I, I, I do reading and I, I consider myself a reasonably smart guy and, and I'm reading things about financial products, the products and thinking, Wow, I'm a reasonably smart guy. I can't understand this at all. I'd have to read it like four or five times before I could understand it. So I was like, okay, how about if I could just only have to read it one time? And how about if I was, if I was able to put it in front of somebody who didn't really know that much about finance and all they, they only needed to read it once? You know, wouldn't that be a great thing? So that's really kind of the goal that I set for myself whenever I was talking about any kind of financial product whatsoever, even at the most basic level. So you're at CNBC in Hong Kong. Um, I know you eventually wind up in NPR. Uh, mm. wh- where did you go from CNBC and how long did you stay there? Well, I was at, I was at CNBC um, for about a year. And then uh, Hong Kong decided, Hong Kong well, didn't decide. Hong Kong at that point was handed back to the Chinese <laughs> after the, the 99 year lease. So I'm like, oh, it's time to leave. It got decided <laughs> for them. <laughs> got decided for them, yes. I mean, you know, it, was, it was like your lease running out. Okay, right. I guess we're, we're done now. Um, and, you know, I, I decided at that point, well, you know, Hong Kong was a fascinating place, but I wanted to move on. And um, so I worked the handover. And then five days later, I left and uh, I bounced around a lot. I went to Sarajevo for about a year. So I was working in, in Bosnia and the former um, uh, former Bosnia Herzegovina then. Then I, I was in Vietnam for about a year. Then I went to New York um, for about a year working with institutional investor. And then um, I got hired by um, a, a dot com to move out west. It was, they actually hired me in the middle of winter. So it was, it was an easy decision to make. Right. Um, so that's when I, I moved to, to Los Angeles. And then and then I, I was with them for about a year. But they went bust in the um, in the first dot com bubble when that burst. And then I worked for Standard & Poor's, uh, work, effectively working on Wall Street, although I was still in California. And, um, and the, the whole time I was doing that, I was, I was freelancing for NPR and for Marketplace. And then I joined Marketplace full time in 2007. 
So that was uh, doing full-time uh, business reporting on the radio. When you're working for S&P from the West Coast, mm. um, what what did that do for your uh for your work day, uh, because the, the financial markets are, are, uh, when you're on the West coast, everything's happening really early in the day. Uh, and then when all the markets close and all of that stuff, you, you've got the better part of half a day left. Um, did, did you find yourself with, with time on your hands to pursue other, uh, writing endeavors or, or journalistic endeavors? That is exactly what happened. So, you know, we, we were working wall street hours. So I was up at five and I was done at two. Wow. Um, yeah, it was great. So, and you know, I'm, I'm an early bird anyway, so that was easy for me. But at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was then okay. I can do I can do one of three things. Okay, I can either go surfing, which I did sometimes, yeah, or I can go I can write um I can write fiction, or I could maybe do some radio stories for NPR. And I kind of divided my time between these three things. And initially, I, I had this idea of being a broadcast journalist and getting into broadcast. So I did a lot of those types of uh, radio stories. But the whole time I kept on being pulled back to fiction again and again and again. And I had a number of kind of fiction projects on the boil. None of them were really very good, but they really kept my hand in, and kept me ticking over as a fiction writer you know, for the next sort of, you know, five to seven years or so. And then, of course, I'd go surfing every now and again, too. Did the did the different mediums uh, you were working in, uh, television with CNBC, radio with NPR, uh, the, the written journalism and then the fiction you were working on these are 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 all uh jobs that are akin to each other but use slightly different skill sets uh in in presentation mostly but the uh the presentation is affected by the writing or maybe it's the other way around uh but as you're working on these things do you do you find that you are uh, that, that one feeds the other or maybe one frees up a certain part of your brain that then allows uh, another project to kind of simmer in the background because you're you're working on something else. I, I guess what I'm asking is uh, because these use slightly different tools in your toolbox uh, and, and slightly different areas of your creativity, do you feel they helped one another? Absolutely. And they and they worked both ways. Right. So, you know, when I was working at Stan and Poor's, you know, I'm producing a very specific type of information for a very specific type of client. So that was kind of just that's like a thing. It's like producing a nugget. You send it out and you know the nugget's going to get eaten. It was that, that was that was I wouldn't say brainless because you had to lose a lot of brains, but it, it wasn't really there wasn't that much craft involved in it, apart from making sure that it was, you know, obviously accurate and timely and all the rest of it. But when it came to the broadcast work, like working in radio in particular, it made me a much better editor when it, because I was writing fiction because my, my standards were way higher. You know, you read a book and you, and you give a book like 50 pages, right? And you're like, you know, after 50, it's like it's either you're either in it or you're not. It's the same, it's the same with a radio story. You know, you're listening to it for – I listen to it for 30 seconds and if it, if it hasn't got me within 30 seconds, I'm not, I'm going to stop listening. And so that was the bar for me. It's like, right, these stories have to be this good. So in my own stories and my own storytelling, but also as an editor, when I'm editing people, it's like, look, you know, you've lost the listener at this point. There's, there's no point in carrying on right now. We've got to go back and start again. And that was the same, I think, for the, the way that I approach uh, my, my fiction writing. It's like, I, I know if I've lost somebody, it's like, you know, you read your own work and you're like, okay, this is not good. This is boring. I've got to strip all this stuff out. I've got to re I've got to, you know, couch this in a different way. So I think that that really helped that. But on the, on the other, on, on the other hand, the other way around, you know, the journalism really helped me because it, it taught me how to write short. You know, the, the one thing they say, the easiest thing to do is to be able to write, you could write forever, right? You could write, you can, you can spend hours describing this and that, you know, but you've lost the listener. You've lost the audience. How can you write short? How can you be as economical as possible with your thinking and with your sentences and your sentence structure and the, the, the way that you're putting those ideas across? So journalism really helped me in that way because it, it taught me that discipline, which I think is invaluable in a writer. Uh, radio also, uh, uh, there's a... Uh... When you're making a story for radio, you also have the added factor of people tuning in at random times. Uh, someone mm -hmm. may flip the dial and come in three minutes into your story. And if you don't have a hook within uh, uh, that section, you're going to lose them as well. And I, I think writing for radio also teaches you to uh, to keep the story interesting, not only to catch them up front, 
but it, you need to keep them interested uh, and then yeah. make them wonder what they just missed before they tuned in. Uh, you know, we don't really have that problem in podcasting because people listen in with intention, uh, mm. you know, but you, you still need to keep it interesting. And uh, I think as a fiction writer, learning not only to write that, that great first chapter that just grabs someone by the throat, um, but then also writing a great third chapter and a great fourth chapter and, and keeping, keeping the reader just salivating to turn the page to find out what's next. So that I've got two really uh, interesting kind of, um, uh, I, I, I want to call them mentors, although I've, I've met, I, I don't know them personally, these people, although I've met them and been in their sort of circle. There's a guy called Ira Glass, who's a, um, a radio producer for This American Life. And, and he has this, uh, and then the, the other person is a guy called Peter Mace, who's a very, very famous agent in New York, a very influential agent. So Ira Glass has this thing about radio storytelling. It's like when you're telling a story, you have to have every minute of that story, whether it's 10 minutes long or 30 minutes long or three minutes long, at every minute, there's got to be something significant happens that moves the story along. I mean, really significant. The people sit up and pay attention. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. So I've always used that as a, as a radio storyteller and an editor. And Peter May says this similar thing that he says. I went, to, I, I went to a conference once and he said this. He said, what you need to do with your book to know that it works, if it's going to be a, a breakout novel, is to take your novel to the top of the nearest flight of stairs, and hopefully they're more than three steps, as in my house. It's like a big flight of stairs, and you take your novel, and you take out the paper clips and all the rest of it, and you throw it from the top of the steps. <laughs> and then you go down to the bottom, and you pick up pages at random, and you read the page. And if you do not want to read the next page, you are not doing your job right. It's like every page should be able to stand on its own and pull you into the next page. And I thought that was such a profound thought. I mean, I think those two thoughts kind of go together. But I think it's you're absolutely right. It's about creating that tension and that pace and that the, the, the compulsion to drive you on to the next. So that you want to sit there all night long reading that book. You know, I think that's such an important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you said that you were working on fiction this whole time, uh, but mm. you felt like that uh, it was not – you weren't there yet. Uh, you, you were still trying to find your voice. Maybe, uh, what, what types of things were you writing at that time? And, uh, what was it that you feel like you were still, uh, trying to learn to get to that point? So I guess I wrote, um, I wrote really two, I was writing a lot of sort of short story type stuff and, you know, none of it was that great. And I, and I, and I took a couple of classes, you know, I went to a couple of writing workshops and stuff and, you know, I, I was really, I got, this is the point at which I got very interested in crime fiction. And in fact, my, the, the, the kind of person who really got me there is uh, Lee Child. I remember reading his kill, his killing floor, you know, his first book and just being mesmerized by that and thinking, wow, if a guy who at 40 years of age was laid off from his television job and then started writing can write this, surely I, I can, I can give this a shot. So it was a real inspiration to me to, uh, to, to, to try my hand. What's a brilliant wrote, it's, debut novel. It's a brilliant debut novel, right? It's incredible. And do, uh, I, have you heard the story about how he wrote this? Yes. How he did this? It's amazing. <laughs> he just got like three exercise books and just wrote it in a longhand pencil. <laughs> and he shows it to his wife and says, should I keep going? She's like, oh, yeah, keep going. Like, I'm like, what? How can that be? <laughs> the guy's like a savant. He is. And I, I've seen interviews with him where he says that, that he writes uh, a very clean first draft and he, he gives it to the editor. And I, I'm sure this is hyperbole on, on some level, but gives it to his editor and says, okay, you're, uh, you're allowed three edits. Go nuts. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Have, have you read this, this, uh, this book of his? It's called um, Reacher Said Nothing. It's by a guy called... Uh, Andy Martin, he's a, he's an, he's a, he's an academic at the University of, of Oxford or Cambridge in the UK. And he followed, um, re he followed Lee Child around while he was, he was writing, um, a novel from two or three years ago called Make Me. It's, it's a, a fascinating insight into Child's process. I mean, it really is just, the guy is just, he's a freak of nature. I mean, really. Well, there was a, uh, there was a story about the writing of that book. Maybe it was in the New Yorker or, or something like that. It was a, a, a very in-depth piece. Um, and so I knew that project was going on, but I haven't actually read the book that came from that. Uh, I'm going to go pick that up as soon as we're done. That's, yeah, it's a, it's a great book, really worth reading. I mean, especially if you're an aspiring writer, just to sort of get a sense. I mean, I have to be honest, 
it's a little intimidating because you're like, oh my gosh, I could never write like that. And certainly I can't write like that. But just to get a sense of what is possible, yeah. it's just it's remarkable. I mean, the guy is a, a very interesting guy. Sorry, I think you asked a question there, but I probably buzzed it completely. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah I, I was just asking what you, you had you had started writing uh, crime fiction mm-hmm. and, and Lee Child inspired that? Yes. Yeah, so I was crime fiction was really where I wanted to go. I was really interested in the whole kind of I was interested in two things, actually, that the child actually is 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 kind of highlights quite well. The first is, is that sort of crime and thriller genre, you know, where you have, you have somebody who's in a situation, there's a, there's a puzzle to solve and the, the, the clock is ticking. That's the, I kind of really like that format. But I was also really interested in writing about people who are slightly, they don't, they don't fit that well. And if you know, if you know anything about Lee Child's Jack Reacher character, he's kind of a misfit. He doesn't, he doesn't really fit in any situation that well. Not that he's not competent or, or you know, like a whole person, but whatever situation he's in, he doesn't fit that well. And he, he didn't really fit that well, it seems, in the end, in the in the, in the the U.S. military where he comes from. And I've always kind of felt that about myself in a way. And I wanted to I wanted to have that kind of characterization in the characters that, that I was writing about. So that you have this situation where you've got to solve a puzzle, but it's got to be solved by somebody who doesn't really fit that well into the environment, which actually sort of complicates things for him or her and makes things a lot more difficult. So that was... That was the way that I was thinking. And I, I, so I started with crime and then I kind of shifted to young adult because um, I have uh, like a family history. Uh, we've got relatives in Scotland and there was this sort of story of this mythological story about the family in Scotland years ago. And I, I was like, oh, I, I, I like to kind of write a story about this. And it was about a, a young character based in the uh, 1600s who sort of, it, it was a historical fantasy. He gets sort of chased around the world by a demon. And it's, it's kind of, it's, it was a little odd, but you know, I had a lot of fun with it. it. Again, it was this misfit character. Again, there was a puzzle to solve. So it was, it was kind of an extension of the same kind of series of themes, but neither of those projects went particularly well, but it was fun. It was fun working on them. It really sort of helped me polish the craft, I guess. Well, you know, writing a fantasy story, um, will really stretch you uh in ways mm. that that you uh, never anticipated um there, there's something about telling uh a story about mundane things uh and and mundane people and then throwing in uh, a bit of the supernatural that will just kind of crack your imagination open uh and then, then whether you continue to write fantasy or not uh, i think the skills that you pick up from that uh are, are always valuable yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, somebody asked me the other day, is, is it easier to write fiction or nonfiction? And I said, I, I think it's actually, because it's actually you can make everything up in fiction. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's the point. You have to make it up and it has to be really good. And that's hard enough if you're dealing with reality. I mean, imagine if you're dealing with fantasy. So I think that when you're making something fantastic up and it's completely, you know, it is complete fantasy, but yet it still works, you're really hitting your stride there, which is why I have so much admiration for for writers of fantasy who can, who can pull it off, who can bring me into that world. You know, I mean, you know, Tolkien's the obvious, the, the big, the big gun there, but you know, all of these people that are writing amazing fantasy right now, um, you know, George R. R. Martin, you know, all of these people, if you can, if they can pull you into that world and you believe it, you believe there are dragons flying around, then they've done, they've done the, the most amazing job, I think. So I, I have, I, I think you're right. It really, th- those skills really helped me, really helped me open my mind. And, you know, my, my wife's a big improviser, and there's this thing in improv where you just accept what, what's being put in front of you. You say yes, and this. And right. if you can do that in writing and make it work, man, you're, you're, you're off to the races, no question. Yeah, if, if you can master the art of yes and, uh, mm-hmm. then, then you can be a writer. Um, yeah. I, I was interviewing Jim Butcher the other day, the fantasy author, mm-hmm. and uh, Jim uh, said that, that he gets his – rules from for writing fantasy from mark twain of all people and uh mark twain said that if you're uh, gonna uh add uh if you're gonna have a story with fantastical elements for every one fantastical element it needs to be anchored by two real world elements uh so that if you can have if you can give people things that they're familiar with and comfortable with and then throw in something fantastical every now and then uh they're more willing to uh suspend disbelief and and stick with you in the story and uh I thought that was great advice <laughs>
That's great. I think that's that's a great tip for any kind of writing. Actually, I think that's exactly. really good. The, yeah, my point exactly. It translates uh, across everything because if you're writing uh, conspiracy thrillers, uh, you know, there's not always an NSA agent over your shoulder, uh, mm. but. Uh, you know, if you introduce enough Facebook and enough Twitter into the story, you will believe that there's NSA over your shoulder. <laughs> That's such a, you know, I haven't read um, Bill Clinton and James Patterson's novel yet, but I wonder if they've done that in there. I, you know, I wonder too. And um, I, I asked, uh, I, I asked a question on Facebook the other day if, if people were going to to read that, and I, I got a lot of negative responses. I was yeah. really surprised. Uh, and and you know, um, Bill's got some some baggage uh, nowadays. He's dealing. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far as, uh, if anyone could write a white house thriller, you would think an, an ex president would be the person to do it. Um, but yeah, I, well, I, I well, wonder. You, you, you'd, you'd hope so. I mean, there were those who would say that, you know, Bill has a flexible relationship with the truth, but that shouldn't <laughs> be a problem if you're a fiction writer, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, you did. You did go on to write a uh, a nonfiction book and uh, Man versus Markets: Economics Explained, Plain and Simple. Uh, how did that book come about? Well, that really came about as a result of the radio work that I was doing. So when I when I was hired into Marketplace, which uh, goes out on the NPR system, uh, the they hired me just as the financial crisis was about to kick off. And of course, when the financial crisis happened, everybody. You know, all the business pages were basically on the front pages of the newspaper. And so everybody who's who'd never read the business pages before was saying, what the heck is this? There were all of these financial terms they couldn't understand. So I I kind of developed a bit of a brand and explaining these things in, in very short videos. And it helped because, you know, I'd done this as an intelligence officer. I'd done this at CNBC. When I was at Stand and Poor's, I kind of gained a reputation for being able to explain this stuff to newcomers who were, you know, starting in the business. And so I basically just took those skills, repackaged them a little bit and launched them on this, on the marketplace.com website. And I then once the financial crisis was over, I thought, okay, well, I should really just like take these, these concepts and put them into a book. You know, it's, we've got them all on video. They work as, as radio explainers, the sort of these two minute hits. Is it possible to translate that into print and, and put them in, and, and package them as a book? And so I spent a year doing that and it was, it was great fun. But as I say, you know, the difference between, you know, nonfiction and fiction, you didn't have to, I didn't have to make any of that up. You know what I mean? It was all, it was all whole cloth. It was just a case of kind of rearranging it and writing it in a way to make it compelling so that it, uh, people could actually find it, um, interesting and and they could stick with it and it could actually teach them a few things so it was a, it was a great little exercise and the you know the book is doing really well it just it actually just got translated into chinese i got the first chinese editions the other day which is quite exciting so you know it's 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 done very well that's awesome that is yeah awesome. um your new novel the devil's half mile uh, which is which is out now everybody it's available uh you can pick it up in uh kindle version uh hardback audiobook it's available every every way that you consume books uh this book seems to me to be a culmination of all of those things that you love and all of your previous writing pursuits uh do you feel like that's that's the truth it, i think it really is and part of this is because it didn't actually start as a, a fictional work, I actually wanted to write a, a, a sequel to that Man vs. Markets book. I wanted to write a, a book explaining how financial markets are created and specifically the New York Stock Exchange, which was kind of created out of a financial crisis in the late 1700s. And, you know, so it started as an explainer as part of my usual journalism work. But I, I've got to be honest with you, Hank, you know, it was, you know, when you're doing, reading all of these letters from, you know, People like Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and Aaron Burr and all the rest of it. It's kind of it's kind of sexy initially, but it gets real boring real quickly. <laughs> right. It was so dull. So I basically started to I started to write a little murder into the narrative just to sort of keep my hand in, you know, and just for a bit of just for a laugh. But I realized that sometimes the best way to tell a story is to tell a story, you know. And if you and if you don't have those characters available to you in nonfiction, then maybe you just make them up in fiction and you you have this kind of sexy story going on in the middle of a frame and if the frame is what delivers the uh delivers the message that you're trying to get across as opposed to the interaction between the characters so the interaction can be all made up but if everything else around them is real then people are still getting that message whether it be you know explicitly or implicitly you know it comes across in us os in, in osmosis in a way so yeah it was a kind of a culmination of that 
I wanted to explain certain things about financial markets and regulation and you know the, the debate between whether we should have rules or if we should be self-regulated. I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about the Irish immigrant experience and sort of get that you know, that part of my history across. And again, I wanted to you know to to tell this story about I, I wanted to tell a murder story, and I also had this character who's who doesn't really fit that well into that environment. So yes. You're right. It is kind of a combination of all of those things. You're absolutely right. Well, what is the, uh, the the quote that's often bandied about? Uh, the fiction is the 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 lie uh, that that exposes the truth, or the lie that is the truth. Um, I, I, I don't know that phrase, but that's that's about right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's absolutely on the money. It's uh, you know, you can, uh, and that's that's one uh, one thing that makes propaganda so uh, uh, mm. so so dangerous is because we do have the ability to wrap uh, wrap things in story and get down to people's subconscious level and to impart truths or mistruths uh, or, or whatever uh, because story is so powerful. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. That's why this, this whole fake news phenomenon that we're hearing right now is so insidious and so dangerous. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you've got the story of the, the founding of the, the financial market uh, in, in the U.S. and that uh, then uh, – filters out from there uh what was this initial story that captured your imagination and and you said that you know just for laughs to throw a murder in uh but Mm. i i'm assuming uh because uh the the truth is uh is sexier than fiction a a lot of times uh what did you start to uncover that made this such an exciting story for you well you know i was it's interesting because i was doing this remember you know sort of seven six or seven years after the after the 2008 financial crisis and uh you know the reason i so you know i, I was interested in in regulation because dodd frank was the dodd frank act was coming out there and it hadn't actually been signed at that point but everybody was talking about it all the time and it was this whole idea of having a system of rules and i thought okay that's the that's the, the new york stock exchange you know the stock market so let's talk a bit about that so i did a little research into it and i realized that the stock the new york stock exchange was recreated really because of a financial crisis, but well, I had never heard of this before. But there was a there was a there was a financial panic of 1792, where a uh, a very unscrupulous um, stock market um, speculator had speculated had borrowed heavily in order to speculate on on government bonds and bank securities on bank stocks, and he the market had moved against him. He'd lost all of his money. He wasn't able to pay people back. As a result, they weren't able to pay people back. You had a run on the banks, just as we had a run on the banks in 2008, and the the, the system froze up. And Alexander Hamilton had to step in and stop this panic by bailing the banks out. I was like, well, it sounds exactly the same as what just happened like five years ago. I mean, it was incredible. I had no idea about this. So I thought, you know, that in itself is interesting, but it's almost – it's, it's, it's a hard story to tell and hold somebody in there because it's a guy who borrowed money and he couldn't pay it back. And we've heard that before. You know, did anybody die? No, nobody actually died. Did anybody go to jail? Well, he went to jail, but only because he couldn't pay his debts. You know, there was, was there anybody murdered? No, nobody was murdered. But so, you know, the, 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 the story itself, if you're interested in that sort of thing, is very interesting. If you're not interested in that sort of thing, it's not that interesting. It's just like, okay, you know, don't bore me with that anymore at the dinner party. So I thought, well... You know, in order to make it a bit sexier and to hold the, the audience's attention so that you can sort of deliver these messages subliminally in a way, let's get a murder in the middle of it that's going to sort of, oh, I'm interested in the relationship between these two people. And, oh, is, are, they, are these two going to get into bed together? Oh, is he going to stab her? You know, is she going to stab him? You know, so that's the stuff in the center that kind of holds your attention. But meanwhile, you've got these messages that are coming at you from the sides, which is what I try to do at the same time. Uh it's really interesting in the story is that, uh, like you said, you uh, the story sounds eerily familiar uh, to what happened in 2008. Um, you start to learn very quickly that there really is nothing new under the sun. Um, we have these situations that happen over and over again, and the, the window dressing is a little different, uh, but uh, we seem to be making the same mistakes over and over again, don't we? We do. It is fascinating. And, you know, I think that the... In America, in particular, we are cursed in a way. We're blessed and cursed at the same time because, you know, America was formed in large part because it didn't like the rules that were being foisted on it 
by a government that was, you know, the other side of the Atlantic, right? So it wanted to get, it wanted to get away with those rules, and it was very much into, you know, the Jeffersonian doctrine of self determination. It's like we should be trusted to be able to run our own affairs without some guy, you know, leaning over us and telling us what to do all the time. And that is a really commendable way to think about life. I mean, so I think self determination is a, is a great thing, but unfortunately, it runs up against the reality of the fact that. Especially when it comes to the markets, we are ruled by fear and greed. And also, there's a large amount of money at stake. And when fear and greed and lots of money come together, you know, basically, it's, it's, it's every man for himself, every man and woman for themselves. You know, it's like if you're afraid of losing that much money, then you're going to do whatever you need to do. And self-regulation goes out the window as well. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's really interesting to me to, to, look, to listen to that debate as it was carried out then between you know, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton specifically about regulation of the stock market back then or regulation of the markets back then. And to look at the, the debate that we're seeing right now going on in Congress, you know, when it comes to banking regulation, they're saying, oh, the banks should be allowed to regulate themselves pretty much. So there's this, the same debate is going on. And, you know, America's curse is that it is, you know, in a way that Europe really isn't. The, Europe's, the Europeans are much more willing to accept these rules Americans are much less you know, willing to do that. There's a much more libertarian kind of um, outlook. There's a much more kind of, you know, leave me to, to do what I want. You know, I, I, can, I can be responsible. And as a result, back in 1792, they decided, yep, self-regulation is going to be the way. They didn't have, didn't put any rules in place. And as a result, the market lurched from crisis to crisis. Almost every 10 years, they came into another financial crisis, which was one of the reasons that America didn't grow along, along the scale that it could have done until 1923 when they put the Securities Act in place. So that's almost 150 years of running a market with no rules whatsoever, you know? Self-determination is a lot more uh, sexy if you are truly self-sufficient. Uh, if, yeah. you can, if you can grow or, or hunt your own food, if you can build your own house, if you, can, uh, if you can provide everything that you need in your life on your own, then self-determination is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, mm. If you depend on your neighbors like we do in our economy, that's not quite the same thing. That's true. And, you know, of course, you look back to the foundation of the of the Republic and self-determination was a, a real thing. You know, people were striking out west and, you know, making making their fortunes. And, uh, you know, they didn't they didn't need their neighbors as much. But, of course, what they did is they created these very small communities that leaned on each other. But then they were suspicious of outsiders. So, so like, well, we're going to make our own rules for our own community. And I think that that's the, the self-determination idea, which is where the New York Stock Exchange came in, because, the, like Jefferson, for example, would say, well, we don't need to regulate the markets because these guys are going to get together and they're going to regulate themselves. And in many ways, that's exactly what happened. The problem is, of course, is that, you know, so you'd have these sort of de facto rules that there was no like federal rule or even state ruling, just the rule of the club that you were in. Oh, if you don't do it our way, you're going to, we're going to throw you out of the club. But of course, when it came down to it, you're going to lose a lot of money or you're going to lose your livelihood or whatever. People threw the rules out and they just did what they wanted anyway. So, you know, the, the, whole, the whole concept of self-determination founders, I think, when it comes up against those, those twin impulses of fear and greed, especially when there's a lot of money at stake. Right. Uh, Patty, b before uh, or when you got the idea for this book and it started coming together, um, you had tried your hand at, uh, at a lot of different fiction before this. What did you feel was the, the factor that made this book special? And that you knew would uh, would see this book succeed. Well, I've got to be honest with you, Hank. I did not think that this book would necessarily succeed. I mean, I believe in my I believe in myself, right? I believe that I've got the, the ability. That I've got the ability to write. I, I I thought in myself it was it was pretty good. But the stuff I'd done before, I thought was pretty good too. You know, I mean, that young adult novel used to be eight hundred pages long. I cut it down to three hundred and fifty. And I thought it was pretty good, but nobody else did. You know, and that's that's sometimes the way it goes. So I had no, I wasn't sure that this was going to make it, you know, in any way at all. You know, I didn't know if an agent would like it. I didn't know if a publisher would like it. But I was, I was, I thought it was pretty good. So I thought, right, I'll, I'll send it out to some of my friends, see what they think, get some of their feedback, and and you know, and then and then go from there. And I think that, you know, for people who are, if there's any listeners who are sort of considering you know, writing something like a novel, like something this large, it's like use all the 
I would say use everything that's out there, that everything that's available to you. Find friends who like to read and just give just give it to them. Don't worry about them stealing your ideas because you know ideas are to a penny. Can you execute is the thing. Get them to read it. Tell them, ask them to be honest. Take take that uh, the, the feedback that comes back. You don't have to take all of it, but you know that's I think the stuff that strengthened me. I was able to to get some of that feedback and incorporate it into the writing, and then I had the courage to send it out and. You know, it, it, it resonated, and that's a great thing. Uh, but I was there was no, I, I certainly wasn't sure that it was going to happen. No, no way. Um, do you feel like that uh, your journalism career and, and all of the facets of that that, that you've uh, pursued uh, all seem to be very collaborative in nature? Uh, you don't just come up with with a piece and and run it to air all by yourself. There there are editors. There are um, uh, different people in the process who all uh, help to mold that piece and, and give feedback and, and, and all that. Do you feel like that that, that aspect uh, of the way you have worked in the past helped in this? Absolutely. I mean, journalism is helpful in two ways, certainly in my career. Uh, so the first way is that it is a very collaborative process. And, um, you know, you've got a deadline, you've got a, you've got a certain number of words or a certain length of piece that you have to produce and um, there's got to be certain elements in it. You're going to be working with an editor and a producer to get this on the air. You know, so so you're used to working in a team, even though you're the primary producer of something. There are other people who are going to be, you know, telling you things about it. And they're going to they're going to pick up stuff that you didn't notice. And you've got to be open to those criticisms because if you're if you're not open to those criticisms and you dig your heel in or your heels in, that piece is not going to make it to air. It's not going to get broadcast and your work is going to be for nothing. So it teaches you to, to develop a thick skin when it comes to working with editors. And it teaches you to, to learn, you know, when to push back and when to, when to give way. Because sometimes you should push back on your editor. Sometimes you should say, no, it's absolutely vital we keep this voice. And sometimes the editor's wrong. And, and a good editor will say, you know what, you're right, let's leave that. But sometimes you've got to listen to your editor and say, you know what, you're right. It's too long. Something's got to go. That's the thing. And I, I think that that was really, really useful for me. Working on a deadline is obviously very, very useful. You know, you've got to get used to being able to sort of generate stuff and you've got to put up or shut up, basically. But the other thing that's very useful is if you're a journalist is that you have you, you've already got an, some kind of an audience. People are already familiar with your work or with the work that the, your colleagues are doing. So that kind of helps you from a platform perspective. So I'm very, very fortunate with the, the career that I'd chosen before I started writing for all of those reasons. Amazing. Uh, Patty, the, the new book is called The Devil's Half Mile. Uh, where does that title come from? So The Devil's Half Mile is a nickname for Wall Street. Now, I, this, this was not a widely used nickname. I've, you know, I found it a couple of a reference to it a couple of times, but it really stuck with me. And initially, I didn't even recognize it for what it was. And we had another a working title for the book, and it was sort of something to do with raising money. And, um, you know, and, and then the, the editor came back and said, I think we need a new title. What can we think of? And I, and I racked my brains for a few days, and then I remembered, oh, yes. And I, I dug it out. It was like, yes, there it is, The Devil's Half Mile. And so we, we use that. Interestingly, though, I, I went onto Google uh, recently, onto Google Maps, and I, and I measured uh, Wall Street. Um, and Wall Street is not half a mile long, right? <laughs> <laughs> from, from Trinity Church at the tip of Wall Street all the way down to the waterfront uh, the east, on the East River, it's about a third of a mile. But I, I think that the devil's third of a mile just doesn't really have the same ring to it. <laughs> it, it doesn't. This, this is a, a prime opportunity for hyperbole. Yeah, absolutely a third of a mile just is a little anemic it just doesn't really cut it does it yeah <laughs> i love it uh so patty the uh like we said the new book the devil's half mile available everywhere historical thriller a body count uh a conspiracy what more could you ask for you know? um if, yeah, uh, yeah it's it's, it's got to be i stuffed it all into the sock there right, didn't it? right um if, if people are just learning about your work and just meeting you uh where can they find you online to follow along and to uh connect with you maybe and to to stay informed about what's coming up with you next well, I'm all over the usual social media platforms. I'm on Facebook at Paddy Hirsch 101. That's P-A-D-D-Y-H-I-R-S-C-H. I'm on Twitter at Paddy Hirsch. I'm on Instagram at Paddy Hirsch. I've got a website, which is paddyhirsch.com. I'm on LinkedIn as Paddy Hirsch as well. So I'm, ev I'm everywhere and I'm posting. I've got some help with this. I've got a, a great a friend of mine, uh, Kaz Santana, who helps me out with the social media stuff. 
uh, she and I are trying to sort of get as much of this information out to people uh, on social media as we can. So I'm available in all those places. And I, you know what? I'm very, very happy to interact with people. Oh, Goodreads as well, which I've really only really just sort of discovered, uh, which I think is an amazing social media platform for readers. I love that. So I'm on Goodreads too. Um, but I, I would love to hear from people. And I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in I'm not so good at posting stuff, but I'm very good at interacting. And I really believe in interacting with, with audiences. And if people read the book, I want to know things about it. I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to chat with people. I'm hoping to do a Reddit AMA pretty soon, actually, as well. So, you know, any questions you have, any about the book, about me, about my process, about my writing, anything like that, I'd love to, uh, to, to engage with people on that. Excellent. Uh, Patty, it's been a great pleasure to talk with you. I, I wish you much success with the, uh, the new book. Uh, everybody, the book is called The Devil's Half Mile, and it's available everywhere. Uh, run out and grab a copy, and uh, let's, let's try to help Patty uh, have an amazing launch for this book. Uh, Patty, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Hank, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. What a great conversation. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. They made instant coffee and laid blankets over a pile of hay. He helped Kate pull off her boots. She volunteered for first watch, but Jason couldn't sleep. Talk to me, he whispered. Kate sipped her coffee. She sat silhouetted against the soft navy sky. A field of stars hung above her. The constellations peered in through the windows and slats. How about a story? Sure. My mom used to tell this one. It's the legend of the star maidens. He watched her words as she spoke, her story illustrated by puffs of vapor that mixed with the steam of her coffee. Long ago... A Mohican brave became lost in this valley. He'd followed a red deer deep into the woods, but the deer had vanished, and as twilight fell, he lost his way. He searched the heavens. He saw a bright star and followed it. It shone upon a clearing in the woods. Spook rock lay at the center, emanating magic. And in the starlight, he discovered the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He discovered a star maiden, she was dancing with her sisters, and all seven were naked. Oh, really? Jason whispered. Seven naked star maidens? Shh. Why do these things never happen to me? The brave decided he must take the star maiden for his wife. So he seized her and threw her over his shoulder. And she loved him for his courage. They married and had a son. Then what? Then it gets sad. The star maiden missed her home. She gazed at the sky every night. She loved her husband and her baby very much. But she missed her sisters, and she especially missed the dancing. So she snuck away one night and returned to the sacred rock. And she begged her sisters, Please appear. Please appear to me for one last dance. They came to her and took her into the sky. Kate's silhouette swayed. One last dance. It was wonderful. And when the dance was finished, they sent her back to Earth. She thought that she'd been away for only a little while. But that one dance had taken many, many years. She ran back to her husband, back to her baby. But they were gone. Her home was empty. The hunter had stopped waiting for her. He'd given up hope that she would return. He'd taken their child and had left with his tribe. One last dance had cost her everything, and she had no home at all. Jason could sense something roiling inside Kate, some brew of feelings that the story had stirred. He wanted to leap up, to grab her and carry her off, his star maiden, and wife. She climbed up to Spook Rock. She heard no music, only wind. She died there of her grief. She dwindled and lost her star form. She became a will-o'-the-wisp, fluttering between the trees. And see that constellation? The Pleiades. Those are her seven sisters, watching down from heaven. And, to this day, 
if a girl has lost her true love, she can go to Spook Rock and dance, and the star maidens will bless her. They'll grant her one wish, any wish at all, except one. They can't make her true love return. <laughs>